Okay, uh, um, apparently this has to be close to me, and there's some technical issues, so my apologies. My name is Caleb Bain, I'm actually Denny and Dinah, as I acknowledge my presence in the Waswas territory, uh, the tribal territory of the uh, Amamutsun band. Um, my suspicion, like yesterday, is that there's not actually anybody in the room from that nation. Um, so at this point, I'm an unwelcome guest. However, I acknowledge that status, and I hope to be a welcome guest someday. Uh, to begin, I need two volunteers. Um, organizers are always convenient. Can I call upon them? Start with you. Uh, give these okay. out to the members of the crowd. Yeah. Um, I'll explain why at the end. I'm going to try and get through about 80 slides, two videos, uh, and a bunch of fairly complex idea and heart ideas and heartbreaking realities in less than 30 minutes. Some are 15 minutes behind, so I apologize for that. Uh, I begin all presentations like this. The picture at the top is in my father's territory, Etchodene territory, um, in Treaty Number Eight, the Western Edge of Treaty Eight. Uh, this is uh, where the Etchodene come from, looking south. The picture at the bottom. Pardon me. Uh, there might be. Um, uh, did we run out already? Yeah. Okay. Well, ap apologies. Um, yeah. Uh, the picture at the bottom. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the picture at the bottom is looking over Moberly Lake, and for those of you who saw the film yesterday in that discussion, that's the lake that will be partially flooded and contaminated with methylmercury contamination as a result of Site C, uh, a large hydroelectric dam. Uh, I'm a treaty Indian. This is one of the treaty medallions given by the Crown to the nations who signed. My family has two. Uh, when we adhered to treaty, this is the uh, historical map of that treaty. My father would have been what they called a slave. My mother would be half beaver, half Cree. This is the contemporary delineation uh, in modern sorry, geopolitical framing. Uh, 88,000 square kilometers, and as you'll see, quite relevant. What I'll try to present after the introduction protocol, which I've completed, is my perspective on colonization and resource extraction commonalities. I'll outline these four dynamics that I would engage with. I think they're germane to our work. Uh, I will end with some key questions and thoughts, and already my thinking has been evolved, in particular by Jason yesterday, uh, but also by the discussions that we've had. My questions need to change. I will end also with an ask and a couple examples of the kind of work that we're doing in Canada and British Columbia uh, to engage in this. You should never have more than five words on a PowerPoint. <laughs> Solidarity, homie. Uh, but I'm going to fuck with you. Uh, I'll, I will share this with the organizers if you want to take a run through it. In essence, I'm interested in the diffusion of uh, extractive technologies. They have been consistently used in my territory to great effect. And to me, that's, for me at least, the relevant nexus of analysis and praxis. Um, in my view, the historical tactics that we use to engage this as indigenous people in my country and emerge in, in the modern era with allies are inadequate. And I think that has big implications for our analysis and has big implications for our work. Uh, key terms, um, of course, the polysyllabics are always fun, notwithstanding my uncouth appearance, I'm familiar with them. The key one in this is epigenetic transgenerational inheritance of disease. That's uh, one of the focus areas for my work and I think really important for us to think about as we engage this question of um, capitalism and resource extractive technologies. I'll go through the four dynamics as quickly as I can. Uh, the first is legal justification intrinsic to colonial environments. In Treaty 8, these are a couple of the emergent issues, so terra nullius, um, I think you guys should be familiar with that. Uh, sister in particular, eminent domain, a contemporary manifestation of those ideas. In Canada, the Indian Act 1867 ensured that I am amongst the most regulated people in the country. Their uh, similarly regulated people would be violent offenders, sex offenders, um, deviants of all kind would have the repressive colonial arch legal architecture imposed upon them, so too with indigenous people. And that passes through to the modern era. Uh, for those of you who don't know much about Canadian law and Canadian history, in 1982, we repatriated our constitution uh, from Britain. And in that repatriation process, through the work of a solid man named Elijah Harper and others, uh, in section 35 of our constitution, indigenous rights were enshrined. Uh, however, that enshrining has currently turned into a mechanism of profound enmeshment. 
And I think that's a deep, deep problem from a legal perspective. Uh, and now what's happened, for those of you who follow the discourse in Canada, and I suspect globally, reconciliation is a bandied about term often used. For those of you who saw the movie yesterday, me and my father testified together at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which itself was the product of a class action settlement. All the Indian kids who got raped like my dad sued while the ones who survived. Um, and were likely to win, so the government cut a deal. Uh, in the process, indemnifying major churches, hiding a bunch of pedophile priests and nuns, uh, and forcing a lot of survivors into a process that partially, uh, at least, killed a lot of indigenous people. Being poor and having 60 years of trauma, uh, and then getting $35,000 cash, is a good way to kill a lot of people. Um, and a lot of predatory law firms in particular capitalized upon this process and used it uh, to great effect to aggrandize themselves. Um, and finally, for those of you who follow the indigenous discourse, impact benefit agreements, strategic engagement agreements, environmental assessments, various things. In my view, those are mechanisms of enmeshment with the colonial extractive architecture. Uh, this is a thesis on reconciliation. This is germane to the Canadian environment, but in essence, reconciliation functions as a mechanism to ensure the continuation of property relationships in a nonviolent way. I didn't understand this. I became a lawyer foolishly thinking that I was getting the tools to engage, and at some level that's true, but at another level I became a part of this system. And for those of you who saw the film yesterday, I was queried by some hardcore Taliban brothers about that issue. Legal history of this relationship, and this is relevant to all of us, but in the early era, for a lot of reasons, the colonial powers had to have nation-to-nation -nation relationships. Holy Jesus, thank you. Um, in the suppression era, 1860s and 1950s in Canada, extermination, assimilation, residential schools is the key example. Uh, in the anger and recognition era from the 50s to the 80s, you go through, uh, this is a picture from Oka, quite famous. Um, you get through a couple of instances and eventual enshrinement in the Constitution. And then in the reconciliation era from the 1990s till now, uh, you have the duty to consult, negotiation, co-management, modern treaties, and of course you have experienced the duty to consult, the thin edge of the wedge by which colonization compels you to participate. Consistent dynamics, uh, steady movement from overt violence, increasingly complex processes. I think these processes are actually repeated for all populations, and that point came up yesterday. Uh, the process of engagement, the process of relations and relationality is itself a mechanism of disempowerment, in my view. Uh, continued erosion of land and water resources and, of course, the deployment of new extractive technologies. So guns and traps, SAG-D fracking, cyclic steam stimulation, uh, a continuum of extractive technologies that are continually applied to indigenous lands, indigenous bodies, and indigenous realities, and working globally and in concert, which is a point I want to discuss. Uh, this is just a couple examples. One, the point I wanted to make with this is notice pipeline and solar native land and the broad demographic represented here. This is from Burning the Mountain two years ago. Um, this was an urban protest, uh, has a rich analytical history, but I just like the idea that it was the technology engaged and this is the subtext. This is the rationale, right, on stolen native land, pipelines. Not like no colonization, not like no genocide, just a technical analysis coupled with a legal reality. Um, this is Grand Chief Stuart Phillip, one of my great heroes, being arrested. Uh, this is a discourse happening in the east coast of Canada. A point here, uh, Edelman Associates, a very uh, elite um, advertising agency, developed a document for TransCanada Pipelines, who my mother works for. My mother is one of the highest ranking indigenous women in the oil and gas industry in Canada. Um, in 2014, Edelman Associates created a document to help them Engaged. And I just wanted to point to this. This is from Edelman. I have a citation here. Um, record low levels of public trust in government, meaning regulatory approval is no longer sufficient for successful project implementation. In my view, in this era, the uh, facade wears thin. The intrinsic relationship between the low-hanging energy and capital fruit is uh, it's easy to justify. It's accessible. Of course, the uh, the world, the hidden world that is the capital source is easily exploited when there's a billion of us. But in a world of 7.6, that 
that's not true. And I wonder if these kinds of characterizations for the corporate populations represent that erosion, represent that corrosion of easy to access systems. And you can see how they characterized the legal system of justification as insufficient to get to yes. To me, that's, that's helpful, but it helps us understand this historical trajectory. Um, I'll go through this fairly quickly. Essentially, I view fracking, so high volume slip water, hydraulic fracturing combined with horizontal drilling, for those of you who are technically oriented, um, as a key example of regulatory capture. I don't think I need to have a definition. You guys are all hella smart. Um, a few characterizations from SFU, again, more than five words in a PowerPoint. I only offer this just for your own analysis. I'll provide you the presentation with the ask that you don't actually share it widely. Um, in British Columbia, uh, my mom helped set up the BC Oil and Gas Commission in 1996. And I was there as a young person helping her analyze the documents. My mother plays the inside strategy quite hard. And I know Andrew, who wrote this very famous columnist in Canada working on tar sands issue, and I share this because he's right, but there was still people I know, like my mother, with a solid heart inside the process, which means that the legal justification scheme is quite effective at wrapping up the forces of resistance, in my view. Um, this is an example of process. This is the current interim consultation process used as Treaty 8 First Nations in British Columbia. Um, industry submits application, OGC completes assessment. There's a characterization scheme. You go through a consultation process. There's a number of defined days, and then you get to yes. Um, and that, that is the process by which you court proof these things. Um, and it's a ta challenging process. It's a process that you know quite well. I suspect you have something similar in your territory. Um, this is an interesting point of regulatory capture. The, reason, the real reason I went to Aotearoa, to New Zealand, again, for those who watched the film, was I was chasing the head of the Oil and Gas Commission, uh, who, this is the document, the commissioner's leaving the BC Oil and Gas Commission. Three days later, he shows up working for Apache Corps Canada, and because of all of us in the Northeast felt it was inappropriate, he signed a bunch of 25-year water licenses right before he quit, and then went to work for the very company who got said water licenses. We essentially pushed him out of the jurisdiction. So he went to New Zealand to sell fracking technology to the Maori and tell the story of Northeastern British Columbia as a win for indigenous people. So I was like, nah, fuck that followed him uh, because I was in law school at the time. I had the capacity and the privilege of arranging a uh, exchange in New Zealand. So I chased him across, across the water. And um, in my view, that represents, not my work, because I'm not that special, but um, that dynamic of switching over, you know what they call it in French, uh, pantouflage, you know, the, uh, the golden triangle between bureaucracy, industry, um, and like the informal legislative government. That, that triangle is very strong in my jurisdiction. Uh, an evolving issue, this is from three weeks ago. There was recently a decision, and this is my point about regulatory and legal structures. Uh, there is a decision that says that um, you can divest yourself of um, non-productive assets in a bankruptcy. And the point I want to make with this slide, this will go to the Supreme Court shortly in Canada, but the point I want to make is that in this era of global decline, in the era where the low-hanging fruit isn't present, the legal justification schemes are showing their true colors. And I think that's interesting. You know, we'll see where this case goes, but it is generating very significant interest. And I suspect if the decline continues in this country, you're going to see something similar, right? A corporate entity that can divest itself of inconvenient assets in the event of bankruptcy and put them upon the public, that's an interesting dynamic legally from my perspective. Um, technologically, so that's one dynamic, legal justification schemes and their eventual failure, their capacity to incorporate their predatory nature. Uh, technology, I view all of these on a continuum um, and all of these are present in my territory, to which I'll explain. Again, uh, geopolitically, 88,000 square kilometers. I mean, know what that is in miles. You guys should probably switch one of these days and join the rest of the world, but be that as it may. Uh, we happen to sit on top of the Western Canadian Sedimentary Basin. Right? This is third largest hydrocarbon deposit on the planet, world's largest industrial development, the source of a portion of what would be going into the pipelines that crisscross Turtle Island. 
A uh, few of the corporations that work in our territory, by no means all, but examples of the types of entities that we've been engaging for the last 40 years. Uh, this is BC and Alberta, and I want to show with this series, uh, this is the Site C Dam, uh, the third dam in the Peace River. Uh, that complex of dams as they exist supplies one third of the electric power in British Columbia. Um, adjacent to that are major coal fields. Adjacent to that are two major shale plays. Um, for those of you who don't know, like this is the tar sands, this is Edmonton, this is the linkage point for all the pipelines that go in each direction. Um, this is the deep water ports, this is Vancouver. Uh, this play is liquids rich and because of domestic overproduction in North America of gas, because we didn't regulate the diffusion of hydraulic fracturing technology, the gas price is depressed. So what's happening, interestingly, is this gas is quite dry, so it's not developing that fast. This gas is quite wet, so what they're doing is they're making most of their gravy off of the condensate, uh, the condi that comes up with the gas, because it's wet gas, you have natural gas and condensate, and the condensate goes over to the tar sands. Interconnections, right? The technology now is bigger than manufacturing traps in some foundry in England. The technology now is deeply interconnected. I'll, I'll show some examples. Um, this, those coal bed methane tenures, those are what the Taltan were fighting and they were successful against. Those mines went forward, these mines went forward in my territory. Power from Site C to fracking in mines, condensate and gas from fracking in the tar sands, twin condensate lines coming in from the deep water ports on the coast into the tar sands, sending tar sands bitumen out. Um, and then of course these, the tr Northwest Transmission Line is almost a billion dollar subsidy for the mining industry in British Columbia. Uh, but supported by the Taltan because their government, uh, their, their indigenous government is supportive of industry, which is a whole other discussion. Um, a couple examples of the different proposed pipelines. There's many more now. This is from 2008. Uh, this is the Enbridge line, which really catalyzed indigenous resistance in British Columbia. Kinder Morgan Northern Expansion and Kinder Morgan Southern Primary. Those are being contested now. That's actually the basis behind that slide on Burnaby Mountain. Um, these are other different interconnected sections put together, and then this is the collective, right? So you've got the tar sands, you've got the gas fields, you've got the coal fields, you've got the hydroelectric, you've got the mining, all of which is connected to something. And this dynamic replicates globally. And that's the point about the technology dynamic, right? Again, this is not so simple as muskets being made in the old country. This is something very, very different. And I think our analysis has to change. My obligations as a keeper of the water and the ED of that organization is to protect this. Um, this is the Arctic Basin, uh, one of the largest and cleanest freshwater basins on the planet. Uh, this is Site C Dam down there. Uh, gives you a sense of the scale, um, you know, about a third of the size of the United States. Uh, these are the terrains of engagement now. These are the, the topographies of engagement and it's a challenge to protect something that big, you have to think big and small all at the same time. Uh, also, and I'll also point to later, really the heart of the energy water capitalism nexus, uh, in my view, globally, uh, and, and has big implications. This is a picture of the Peace River, so named because there's a location of peace between the Cree and the Daneza, pre-contact. Um, a beautiful and transcendent place, this is it. A year and a half ago, this is it last winter. Uh, this is the site of the Site C Dam. Uh, Nine billion dollar project subsidized entirely by the ratepayer, and actually one of the main reasons why the BC government uh, in last week's election, or this week's election, Jesus, um, we had a minority government for the first time. Uh, the election was deeply contested, and one of the main reasons was a $9 billion publicly funded piece of infrastructure that did this over the significant legal and physical objections of indigenous people. But it's only one. This is the dam above it, the W.E.C. Bennett Dam, which created uh, the Williston Reservoir, the largest lake in British Columbia, reservoir, I should say. Uh, this reservoir built in the 60s is what killed all the caribou, and I'll, I'll show you guys some, well, I'll, we'll show off tattoos in a minute. Um, this is a typical example of a processing facility and fracking, you'll notice the pits with the flames. Um, to give you a sense of scale, uh, that's a parking lot down there. Um, and one point I want to make with this is notice the linear disturbance. Those function as superhighways for wolves. 
So we have a huge issue with wolves. My nation, my mom's nation, West Mobile First Nation, where I was employed until I quit and discussed last year, uh, we pay our hunters a thousand bucks a wolf tail to kill wolves because we're trying to save the last 20 breeding pairs of a unique subspecies of caribou. Um, so for those of you who are uh, transhumanist, for those of you who are about protecting charismatic fauna, uh, you need to think about the implications of those positions relative to this. The Daneza tradition requires us to kill wolves and other, and wolves in particular, because traditionally the wolves' great gift and curse, much like humans, is that they can kill quite efficiently. They, they, they're very good at it and they're very, uh, they have a high capacity for self-propagation. So the deal between us and that non-human species is that we work to control their population, to protect other non-human species and optimize the relationships. It's a sacred task. Now think about what that sacred task, what living that treaty obligation might mean when you have hundreds of thousands of kilometers of transmission lines. I am now obliged by virtue of my pre-contact treaty with a non-human entity to kill repeatedly in a way I would prefer not to. How do you navigate that? Again, see how technology interfaces and technological distribution and diffusion interfaces with pre-existing traditions, pre-existing biological systems, pre-existing non-human populations. Um, for those of you who are pro-renewables, uh, uh, some bad news. So the first uh, industrial-sized wind farm in British Columbia was built on my family's trap line. They stole our name. My grandpa, Chief John Doki Sr., uh, the man I love the very most, you saw him in the film yesterday. This is right actually where you saw that, it's near where that video was taken. Um, give you a sense of scale, like that's an excavator, this is a truck. Um, and the issue with this is this renewable energy development did two things. One because it's located at the top of mountains, that's where the caribou go to live in the winter time. So they can see the wolves coming and there's lots of lichen up there. There will never be caribou here again. Caribou are very sensitive to anthropocentric disturbance. They, 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 uh, they don't like being around people. Um, second issue, they copyrighted my family name. Uh, so the Doki family name, Doki phase one, was literally colonized and taken and copyrighted uh, by GE, bought out the company in the end. Um, so again, think about how technology and even uh, helpful technologies interface, uh, quite challenging. A couple of the proposed LNG projects, I won't go into this too much, uh, there's just a lot of pipelines to make the LNG industry work. Areas of conflict, uh, bombings, I wasn't there when that happened in 2008 conveniently. Um, but there's a lot of dynamics that we noticed as indigenous people. Um, and that's, that's actually, uh, you think they're scientists, but that's actually critical infrastructure investigation teams, which are a link between the RCMP and CSIS. So the equivalent of your FBI and NSA, uh, working together to investigate these bombings, which were remarkably well-timed to facilitate militarization of that infrastructure right before the push for LNG happened publicly. Um, these bombings were interesting because they were just right to create some media-ready images, but weren't actually all that dangerous despite being in hydrogen sulfide-rich plays. Very peculiar, never, never solved. Um, the commonalities that I've experienced uh, on the technology front, at least with fracking, um, are uncertainty in every sense, inadequacy, cumulative impacts, regulatory capture, uh, credibility gaps within First Nations communities, so sellout chiefs uh, and pro-industry entities. Uh, and again, if you think about the legal architecture in that interface, that, that creates a very strong issue. Um, it's, and of course, it atomizes the community because we all become workers and individualized, lose our connection, and of course, profound environmental injustice. The capital accrual is significant. Uh, this is from the largest oil lobby in the country. I have a call with them on Monday to help them present to the UN Special Working Group on Business and Human Rights, which I'll discuss in a minute. But in a couple examples, um, largest private sector investor, uh, you know, um, an estimated 15 billion contribution to the, the country. 
Uh, ignorant of consequences, I'm not going to speak to this because uh, this is just sort of medium long-term water contamination. You don't actually map aquifers, so uh, the recharge zones, say a 20,000 year recharge rate, what do you do when you pierce it 15,000 times and put a whole bunch of water down there and pull up a whole bunch of stuff? You know, consequences. This is the thing about the colonial capitalistic resource extractive endeavor. It's always ignorant of consequence. That's that forced amnesia and forced ignorance is intrinsic to its process. Uh, the work I do is more technical in nature now. Uh, so this is research that was presented three weeks ago. Um, they're looking at the toxicology flowback fluid and I'll show you a couple of specifics. Um, these are examples of what's happening. Again, this is a treaty eight thing. Um, 10 to 80% of what's injected. So between the 10 and 100 million liters of frac fluid that go down each well comes back. What does it do? Um, indicators of endocrine disruption. For those of you who are really scientific, we can talk about that. Uh, the research methodologies used in this research, which was again published three weeks ago, uh, are very useful to me. And I think that's the other side of both the techno technology diffusion, that it interfaces with our analytical capacity socially and in the hard sciences. This is an example of that. Uh, key summaries for those of you who live in fracking zones, something that you have to think about in particular. Um, apparent transformation of what's going downhole and coming back up, which has very, FPW stands for flowback or flowback in produced water. The sediments that come back have high toxicity. They alter uh, the living systems. And the uh, biotransformation enzymes, oxidation and endocrine disruptors uh, are not attributable to any specific hydraulic fracturing component. And what's interesting to me, aside from the actual consequences of this shit, of the potential issues, is that the hydraulic fracturing fluid components are protected by trade law, right? So it's, 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 a, it's a copyright issue. It's a trade secret issue to disclose that. Uh, frac focus is bullshit. It's a good step, but it wasn't nearly adequate enough to engage this stuff. And what's happening is the scientific analysis is starting to push back against the data and knowledge gaps that legitimate all this stuff in the first place. Um, I'm going to skip this. Uh, this is my face. There's a reason I care about uh, epigenetic transgenerational inheritance of disease. Um, I had a major birth defect, have, I guess. And um, there's emergent evidence about intergenerational slow onset poisoning, essentially. Uh, a couple examples, and this is germane to a couple people's work in the room. Um, Stress-induced transgenerational inheritance pathologies. Maternal separation and stress, traumatic paternal stress, gestational restraint for swimming. There's the pathology. This is the reference. Uh, you can imagine what they did to my father when he was five and what they did to his cortisol. Uh, response systems in his body or my mother when she faced 40,000 workers coming in as a little girl to build the first dam. Uh, the mechanisms of engagement actually include the genome, the very foundations of our cells. So when elders say the trauma is in the blood, it's quite literal. Uh, another issue with this is uh, subclinical epidemics. So acute poisoning and neurotoxicity is quite obvious, but subclinical effects, particularly in children, populations are very difficult to anticipate. You need a longitudinal analysis to pick it up, right? So when this country banned leaded gasoline, the mean IQ across the country went up after 10 or 15 years. So I suggest you look at the work of Philip Landrigan and Mount Sinai on that issue. I think the same thing is happening in indigenous zones and rural zones. And I think in part, it might explain why there is uh, such significant uh, incarceration rates and abuse rates. It's their, their hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axes have been modified by a combination of social stressors and physical contamination. And I think that's important. Um, 28 minutes, at two minutes left. Knowledge to action. Uh, this is one of the issues. We like the precautionary principle. This is a legal uh, application in BC from 2003. It has yet to be applied. I think this is really relevant to um, engaging because the delay time between these substances and the very uh, knowledge gaps that are intrinsic to applying emergent technology uh, represent something profoundly unjust and something profoundly dangerous. And I think that that danger is sort of an incentive to engagement.
Uh, there's been public health work on this issue. This is the second phase of uh, population health analysis that, connected no that collected no primary data. Um, and of course, the media picked up and said, well, the LNG industry would pose low risk. And of course, it was defended by industry scientists who said that there's low risk, although they didn't say that we didn't actually do any data collection. We just looked at the existing research. Anybody who studies fracking in particular knows that there's been a, uh, a massive increase in research publications, peer-reviewed research publications on the issue. It's one of the fastest growing areas of analysis, hard science and social science. Um, so you can see how the legitimization structures work. Um, issues, environmental injustice, if you have the poor luck of being from Doig River Indian Reserve, you have 351 to 400 operating wells within 15 kilometers of your uh, Look at the distribution, both physically but also in the north. You would never allow this in Victoria or Ottawa or New York or Washington. Well, they might allow it in New York, we'll see, but uh, this is an example of that distribution dynamic that's important for us to consider. This is a more localized application. Uh, this is within five kilometers of the communities, and it just illustrates how the rural, the indigenous, are easily maligned and put into really dangerous environments. Uh, global importance, and I want to thank Jason for this because I have used the language of Anthropocene, of course, the Great Acceleration, quite convenient. Uh, stuff that I work on in particular, the dams and water use issues. Um, but I hadn't thought of the critical lens that you brought to it, that sort of Neo-Malthusian uh, predation of these concepts. And I think that's important to, for me to recollect, so I want to thank you for that. Um, other big issues, so these are global uh, shale plays relative to ancient forests. I think the, one of the reasons I think Treaty 8 is so critically important in addition to having so much hydrocarbons is it's, it's a nexus point between some things that are very interesting. Canada recently took over as the global leader in deforestation rates thanks to re, uh, unconventional energy development. And why does that matter? Um, because there's three large intact ancient forest systems on the planet. Russian taiga, the rainforest, these are heavily impacted, for those of you who work in Asia and Africa already, and Canada. Um, you know, these are not the only lungs of the planet, but there are a couple big ones. And what I think is interesting is that the mechanisms of engagement that we're developing in these jurisdictions, right up here in particular, have global relevance. And that creates some peculiar dynamics. But the end point for me is understanding that there's a biological imperative here at the individual through to the collective. You know, and I'll, I'll explain why here in a minute. Uh, this is an example of water stress. Um, these are the dynamics of concern that I see uh, in pervading the analysis and also my environment. Um, in this world of low credibility, adversarial, the politicization, militarization, um, the risk of subclinical epidemics, uh, altering baselines where we don't have the capacity to pick up baseline information on like mean benzene content of our water systems. Uh, these create challenges to engagement. So I'll show you one mechanism that I've been using, uh, and this is relevant to the arts. Um, this is a bone loose track. Uh, I took this picture three years ago whilst hunting. Um, you see what this is, obviously. Um, when I hunt, I, uh, as I have always done and my grandfathers have done, we always check the meat for things like this. Uh, we cut out tumors all the time. So I have this challenging question of do I feed this to my grandmother? So on the one hand, it's free range organic artisanal, but on the other hand, it has a unknown tumor or cyst. Where's the balance? Where's the balance ethically? You know, do I go buy some cow that was slaughtered in a feedlot? Do I feed this to my aging grandmother? You know, what's the spiritual implications of this? What do I do when I cut it out? Um, one thing that I do uh, is I put a cut in to these tattoos every time I kill uh, as a manifestation of the obligation to give back to that which gives to you. Um, and that's, that's my own choice. That does not derive from any particular imperative. I was never told to do that. It's just my way of being accountable physically. So at the end of my life, my body will bear the consequences of my kills. I will honor that which honored me by giving its life to me, by sharing a small portion of mine, and by sharing the small bit of that pain that it too suffered as it died. 
So I've killed enough things in my life to know that nothing dies easy. And this is a piece of my own engagement with these systems. Um, there's a couple things. Can you turn off the recording device, uh, please? And if you guys can just not record this section.